Okay, let's now look at some basic relationships in data modeling. If we look at the type of relationship that we'll summarize as one to many, we can see here that an employee goes to one and only one high school, but a high school can have zero to many employees that have graduated from it. In this type of relationship, we need a foreign key, the school ID, to match the employee back to the high school from which he or she graduated. You'll notice that Visio will automatically put the foreign key in the entity that occurs many times in relationship to the other. And this is for the reason that we spoke about earlier. If we have two entities, only one needs to have a foreign key in order to match the two entities together. And if multiple employees have graduated from the same high school, that's going to be a problem because we're going to have one row for that school ID and we're going to try to cram multiple employee IDs into a single attribute for that row associated with the school. So that's going to violate our first rule of normalization. But if we put the foreign key on the side of the relationship that occurs many times, that is a high school can have many employees who have graduated from that school, but for each employee they've only graduated from one high school, then the rules work. So for each employee we'll just have one high school ID and that will be the foreign key to match back to the high school entity. In this example, the primary key employee ID in the employee entity is different from the foreign key, but we'll be looking at some situations where one attribute might play the role of both primary key and foreign key. Not every entity needs a foreign key. For instance, in high school, there is no foreign key. And a single entity might have multiple foreign keys if it matches to multiple entities. So in this case we're just showing two entities, but if we had three or four entities, one of them might have multiple foreign keys to match to more than one other entity. When we have an attribute that could have multiple values, for instance, we might have multiple phone numbers associated with an employee or, or with a parent. There are two ways to solve this. One is in the parent table shown here. We could have an attribute for phone number one, phone number two. But the preferred way is what I show, which is a separate entity for the phone numbers. In this case, we have the primary key as a combination of parent ID and phone ID. So phone ID could be uh, H for home, uh, C for cell, for instance. And that combination uniquely identifies each phone number. In this case, the parent ID is part of the primary key in the phone entity and also the foreign key to match from the phone back to the parent. So as I mentioned on the last slide, a particular entity could have an attribute in the case of the phone entity. The parent ID attribute plays the role of both part of the primary key and the foreign key to match back to the parent entity. One-to-many relationships are one of the most common that we'll find and if you want to double check that you've set up your relationships properly, Visio will automatically put the foreign key on the side of the relationship that you've specified occurs many times 
in relationship to the other entity. So you can work through the logic that we talked about earlier to see if the foreign key has been placed correctly. If not, you'll have to change your relationship line. Another type of relationship that can occur is a one-to-one -one relationship. So in this case, we have a locker is assigned to zero or one students, and a student has zero or one lockers. So the maximum in each case is one, and so we can summarize this as a one-to-one -one relationship. In this particular case, where we have a one-to-one -one relationship, the foreign key can go in either entity. So either we could put the locker ID in the student entity, as shown here, or we could put the student ID in the locker entity. But we don't want to do both because when we have two entities in a relationship, we only need one foreign key in one of those entities to match the two together. Now, one of the things to check for when we have one-to-one -one relationships is, are these really two different entities or should these be combined into one entity? So can we just put the locker ID in the student entity and eliminate the locker entity altogether? Well, the way to determine if we can eliminate the locker entity altogether is to find out if there are any attributes associated with the locker, like the combination or the location of the locker or the size of the locker that we need to store. If there are attributes associated with the locker, it should be its own entity. If the only thing we need to know about the locker is the locker ID, we don't need to have an entity that only has a primary key attribute and no other attributes, so we can just put the locker ID in the student table. A third common type of relationship is a many-to-many -many relationship. So if we look here, a student can have one or more parents. A parent can have one or more students. And so if we look at the maximum occurrences on both sides, it's many, and we refer to this as a many-to-many -many relationship. If you try to draw this in Visio, you're not going to be able to. You're going to have to convert this many-to-many -many relationship into three entities. So if there's a many-to-many -many relationship, you need to create a third entity that's called an association entity. And there are two ways you can set up these association entities. The first way is to set up a third entity that has a composite primary key, student ID and parent ID, will uniquely identify each row. And then the student ID attribute becomes the foreign key to link back to student, and the parent ID attribute becomes the foreign key to link back to parent. Another way to solve this problem is to, once again, create the association entity, student parent, but in the case of some database designers, they don't like to have a composite primary key. As I mentioned in one of the earlier videos, if we can avoid a composite primary key, that is two attributes needed to uniquely identify each row, that's preferential. So in this case, we just make up a surrogate key a fake number that gets assigned by the database to force each row to be unique, and we can call that student parent ID. So uh, this is normally a sequential number, so it could start at 1 or 100 or 1,000, however you want to set it up. And the database management system will automatically increment it, so there will never be two rows with the same student parent ID.
In this case, we still need to know the student ID to link back to the student table, and we still need to know the parent ID to link back to the parent table. So as I mentioned, both these solutions work. In the first case, we have a composite primary key, meaning two attributes are needed to uniquely identify each row. In the second case, we have a surrogate key, a third attribute that we make up, that's why it's called a surrogate, that the database management system will make sure is unique. So if you want to see what some sample data would look like, we have a student file here and a parent file here. And in this case, I've set up the association table using the first format where the combination of student ID and parent ID is needed to uniquely identify each row. And the student ID becomes the foreign key to link back to the student table. And the parent ID becomes the foreign key to link back to parent. So if we want to match the students to the parents, we match the student table and the association table together, and then the association table and the parent table together. A form of one-to-many relationships is the strong and weak entity format. The definition of this is pretty simple. A weak entity doesn't exist unless there's a strong entity. So a common example of this is if we purchase something in a store, we'll have an order number and we'll also have an order line item, but the line item doesn't exist unless we have an order number associated with it. The purpose of talking about strong and weak entities is to show you this pattern here. Frequently, the way we set up our primary key for the weak entity is to take the primary key from the strong entity, the order number, and just add another number that we increment to indicate what line number on the order we're talking about. There is an alternative way that we can represent this entity relationship. And instead of having a composite primary key for the order line item, we could create a surrogate key where we just let the system create a line number that's unique irregardless of what order it's associated with. This isn't commonly done, but if for some reason we wanted to do this, we could. We still need to know the order number to match that line item back to the associated order. Now I pose a question here as to whether we also need the price on the line item. And generally the answer to that is going to be yes in order to calculate the total cost. However, we could retrieve the price from another table associated with the product ID. And if the price never changed, that might be a preferred way to solve this problem. And the reason that I bring this up is it's not always perfectly clear what entity the price should be in or any attribute should be in. We need to follow the rules of normalization. We might, in this case, have the price on the order line item because that's the price when this product was bought. And we might also keep price in the product catalog entity, indicating that's the retail price, but not necessarily the price when this particular item was purchased. Another type of relationship is what we call a recursive relationship. Initially, database management systems didn't really like this type of relationship, uh, but they're permissible now. And uh, we have this frequently when an employee re reports to a supervisor who's also an employee. So in this case, the employee would have one row in our employee table, and the supervisor would have one row in the employee table. And the supervisor ID for the first employee would refer to 
the employee ID for that supervisor.